Welcome to Money Making Conversation. I am your host, Rashawn McDonald. I say this every week on my show. It's time to stop reading other people's success stories and start writing your own. We always talk about gifts and passions on this show. If you have a gift, lead with your gift. And don't let your age, friends, family, or co-workers stop you from planning or living your dreams. My interviews on Money Making Conversation include celebrities, CEOs, entrepreneurs, and people I like to call industry decision makers. My next guest is Kamal Murray. He is the founder and CEO of XS Tennis, the Tennis Channel commentator as well. If you watch the Tennis Channel as much as I watch, we're going to get into why I watch it so much. And a professional tennis coach, which is really key because uh, the most proud thing I like to talk about is he's an HBCU grad. He's an alum. He's out there. And HBCUs are getting so much notoriety nowadays. And it's great to see that we're not just a... Because a lot of people look at HBCUs and they have a perception about the band, the halftime, the and all the sports is really bigger than that. And we're going to talk about his experience and his proud background and relationship that he has with with, with HBCUs. But he's the producer of the first professional tournament, ter- tennis tournament produced by an African-American, XS Tennis Village in Washington Park. It's a 16.9 million dollar black owned and operated tennis facility. It is one of the largest indoor and outdoor tennis facilities in the United States. Murray received a tennis scholarship, like I said earlier, Florida A&M, uh, procedurally known as FAMU, uh, where he also served as a graduate assistant coach. The HBC graduate is only the third African-American coach to, pro- to coach a Grand Slam champion. We turn the show to talk about his programs, uh, what, he's, what his future is going to be like, about the, the state of tennis, not only for African-Americans, but just tennis in general. This weekend at the U.S. Open, we saw it got really young. But we also saw a lot of great talent that, is, like when we talk about Coco Golf, Sloan Stevens, so a person he coached in the he's coached. So welcome to Money Making Conversation. I'm gonna call him a friend because uh, he knows a lot of people I know. <laughs> Kamal <laughs> Murray, welcome to the show, Kamal. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Well, you know, man, uh, you know, tennis, you know, when you talk about black people with tennis, you know, you go all the way back to Arthur Ashe. And if you go even further, it's Althea Gibson. And it kind of, then, then the Williams sisters have dominated it. And it's kind of made like uh, the, the blacks have really started populating the game. But really, it still is a game where blacks are still trying to find their way on the tennis court. Am I right in making that assessment, that, 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 that statement? Yeah, I mean, we don't have the generational lineage mm-hmm. uh, that, you know, white people do. Right. You know, I think that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the reasons why some of these kids make it is their parents played in college and their parents, parents played in college. Right. So, you know, after it, it is a total trial and error game in terms mm-hmm. of trying to make a professional tennis player and very few parents get it right the first time. Right. And so the kid that doesn't make it, right, whose parents groomed them, their mm-hmm. kids perhaps might make it because now they don't have to search around. They know, hey, you, at this age, you go to this person. At this age, you go to this person. Right. Then you go play this tournament. So, you know, the, the, you know, white, you know, white people have more uh, lineage in the game because they've just been doing it long. You know, back in the day, right. uh, you know, black people and Jewish people were not allowed to join tennis clubs. Mm-hmm. And so... Um, you know, Jewish people had the, the wherewithal to create their own tennis club. So you have clubs like York Rackets in Toronto mm-hmm. or Hillcrest out in L.A. Mm-hmm. But black people did not have that same opportunity. You know, mm-hmm. we may have taken over a park and called it a club, but mm-hmm. it was just a park and no indoor opportunity. So I think that we're playing catch up as it relates to, um, you know, black tennis players who may right. have played in college now mm-hmm. having kids mm-hmm. and now knowing the role. And so once we start uh, once those kids kind of come of age, we'll see we'll see the landscape of tennis be a lot more colorful. You know, I, my daughter, you know, who I love her to death, you know, she started she picked up a racket when she was six years old, and so basically played it till she was uh, nineteen years of age, and she blew out her knee ACL injury, and I, I saw that process. That process is a you know it's a very um, I want to say it's a, it's, a, it's it's you know you're out there with a coach a lot. It's a, you get up a lot of your personal life to be. What is it when you look at it? Because you did the same thing. This is your story too. Because you know the amount of time you have to put in on that court, and sometimes the social life is not going to be part of that. But you are blessed, I would say, because you got to go to college. A lot of these kids don't go to college, and so life kind of stops for them from an entertainment perspective on the tour. That's their world. And so talk about you as a youngster getting into tennis and how important it was for you to gain some type of social behavior when you went to FAMU. 
Yeah, you know, I think that the individual nature of the sport causes tennis players to be a little bit behind socially. Yes. Not as comfortable being around people, spend a lot more time in isolation or just in the car with their parent Mm -hmm. driving, you know, to and from the tennis court for hours. And so, I mean, it is a fact that tennis players are are developed slower Mm -hmm. on the social aspect compared to, you know, basketball, football players who spend so much time with each other. Right. Um, But I, you know, I, I think that, you know, obviously having an opportunity to go to college, um, you know, allow me to definitely gain some social skills, but it all goes with the cost. You know, I didn't want to play pro tennis. You know, um, Mm -hmm. I would not say that if I had the opportunity to play pro tennis at 17 years old, that going to college just to get socialized Mm -hmm. would have been a good thing. Mm -hmm. I would have gone and taken that opportunity. I didn't really want to play pro tennis. uh, Wasn't good enough. Wasn't interested. Didn't have the lineage or the Mm -hmm. know-how. But I do think that having been a good tennis player uh, and been very cerebral and 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 mentally present during the entire process, when you combine that with my HBCU experience and going to college, getting educated, getting a master's degree, getting socialized, Mm -hmm. that did allow me to enter the the professional tennis orbit, right? right? I mean, it Mm -hmm. is like the the most closest knit club you can have. (laughs) Yes, it is. Um, It allowed me to enter it with a sense of confidence, um, you know, so that I would say it was definitely going to college, having had the experience uh, uh-huh. of being a good player, helped me. Well, you, now, Help you me know, now, now you kind of come out, you kind of like, you, you know, you say, I wouldn't, I didn't want to do a pro. I didn't have the skill set for be a pro, but then you got a scholarship. So somebody saw some talent in you, you know, and it, and it took you to a, the state of Florida. And so, but how did you get, come out? how did you get involved with tennis? How did, what age did you start and who, why did it become a love for you? Because it is what you do now. It's a passion. Yeah. So I would say it wasn't necessarily a love all the time. You know, I, my, my brother, my older brother played, you know, big time basketball. He's like six, nine to 60 now, but he, uh, my parents took his, his, his AAU team to Africa. Uh Uh, and we came back in the middle of the summer and all the tennis camps, all the tennis camps were closed. Uh Uh, All the camps are closed in my neighborhood and only camp that was still accepting uh, enrollment was a tennis camp because right. they basically had three people enrolled in it because nobody in my neighborhood wanted to play tennis. <laughs> right. Uh, and so, you know, I, I stumbled upon the game. My godfather, Reggie Williams, was a tennis player. And he said, hey, you need somewhere to babysit Kamal. Go ahead and take him to Jesse Owens Park on 87th and Jeffrey. Right. And my mom took me there, really just hoping to be able to drop me off and get some cheap babysitting. Right. Um, you know, so it's, it just, uh, it just happened that way. And then, you know, even then, I, you know, didn't love it. You know, right. I was leaving my tennis racket in the garbage can at the courts yeah, that's, because that's I was my afraid daughter. to ride public <laughs> transportation. You know what I mean? And so I, I, I it was a, it was like a walk of shame almost home mm-hmm. right. from the mm-hmm. tennis court yeah. for a long time right. until I started to get decent. Mm-hmm. I had some success and had a sense of pride for myself. Now, it's, it's so funny because, uh, you know, you're right about, you know, socially, you know, you are behind your skill set. I always tell, I always tell my wife, don't worry, she's going to eventually catch up. I said, once she goes to college and starts mingling with people, because you're out there by yourself from a standpoint. But what you do get, you do, you, you mature faster from a standpoint. If that's what you want, you have to work hard for it. You have to be disciplined. You have to arrive at a certain time. You have to put in a certain amount of hours. So it does prepare you for life. So when you open your Tennis Village, you, like you said, you know everybody's not going to be a Venus Williams or Serena Williams or or anybody else who has a high skill level to turn pro. What is the purpose of opening up your tennis academy or the XX yeah. Tennis Village? So, you know, when I was growing up, after that summer where I started playing tennis, mm-hmm. I found a free program at the Hyde Park Racquetball Club. Right. And, um... You know, in that environment, that was like the black mecca of tennis in Chicago. It was the only black tennis club in Chicago. It was black professionals, doctors, lawyers. Um, It was, you know, when Arthur Ashe came to town, he always stopped by there. That's where I met first met Zena Garrison. Like, Mm -hmm. it was the place. Uh, Katrina Adams learned to play there. Donald Young. So, it was like a black mecca. And I went there every day after school just for the free tennis program and the convenient babysitting for my mother. Um... But that environment where you see black people 
uh, just sort of there congregating around the game, tennis, basketball, in the gym, drinking smoothies and wine. You know, I think, <laughs> yeah. you know that helped me as a student. That kept me off the street, right? right? And, you know, I can't tell you the number of times that I would be leaving out the club, walking to the bus stop to try to get a ride, you know, to, to take the bus home. And, a, and, a, and an adult would give me a ride in his Cadillac. You know what I mean? And so that environment where it was, um, wasn't was forced mentorship, but it was just a, the kids in here belong to us. We're going to make sure we practice with them, spar with them, uh, help them with their homework. I used to sit down on my knees and mm-hmm. do my homework on the bench. Right. Right. And an adult would come over, hey, what you doing? You know, let me help you with that math problem, whatever it is. Right. And it was totally authentic and, and not forced. And so, uh, my goal was to create that same environment. So we built the facility literally a mile west of that facility. Um, we got classrooms so the kids don't have to s- sit on their knees and mm-hmm. do homework on the floor. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got adults in the building who have wherewithal, who have the opportunity to, you know, you know, very just unintendedly, you know, meet with kids and get to know these kids so that when they do grow older and get an intern, you know, need an internship, they have some sort of you know, barometer there. So that was the goal was just to recreate the environment that I think kept me alive. I mean, I grew up uh, on the South side of Chicago. Right. Uh, and I had a lot of opportunity to do bad things. And I was a middle child in a middle class family in a middle class neighborhood. Right. And so I had the opportunity to do a lot of bad things. I could hide in my family because my brother was, you know, doing his thing on the basketball court. And, you know, I, my parents were busy. Both my parents worked. You know what I mean? Right. And mm-hmm. so tennis kept me on the straight and narrow, period, point blank. I mean, I I knew and still know people who did, you know, bad things. Right. You know what I mean? You know, that's, that's basically what life is about, you know, the, the, being in the position where you got mentors. You got people who mm-hmm. kept you straight. I always tell people about myself. You know, I, I come from the inner city and, you know, people kept me. I'm, I'm sitting here because people guided me in the right direction. They kept me out of uh, trouble. You know, some words, some people might use the word mischief. You know, mischief can lead to trouble and trouble can lead to incarceration, depending on what direction you take it but you're sitting here today a, a man who's making a difference in people's lives you know you serve nearly 3,000 students annually uh, through your tennis your tennis program and then you're sending kids to, uh, to to college through scholarship programs how does that make you feel you know because it, everything starts with a dream come out you know and I'm speaking mm-hmm. to come Murray he's the CEO of XS tennis you've seen him on the tennis channel as a commentator but more importantly he's a professional tennis coach you know, you're making a difference. You're changing lives. I, I, I created this show, Money Making Conversation, to introduce people like you to view to my viewers and to my listeners to say, wow, you can do this too, but you have to have a plan. And your plan is changing lives. So when you wake up every day, how do you feel? Oh, man. Well, let me tell you, it's hard work. So I mean, I feel, uh, <laughs> I'm glad that the building is built and I'm glad that we're operating. We've been operating four years. We, we, we started going in 2005, right? right. Then we mm-hmm. got our, old, our older facility. We got control of that in 2008. Uh-huh. Uh, and we moved in this building in 2017, but it was not easy. Uh, and so when I wake up in the morning, I'm exhausted. Uh, I'm very grateful that we were able to get to the finish line, but exhausted because the work never stops. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, around three or four o'clock when these kids start walking in, these parents start dropping their kids off and they are first generation tennis players with no knowledge and just a blank canvas. I mean, that makes it all worth it. Um, but, you know, I'll be, I'll be honest. You know, it was a lot of times in the process where I was like, I got a job. I got two degrees. I could do something else. Is it worth the fight? Right. You know, it shouldn't be this hard to do good. And so uh, it has not been like a um, a smooth road. But, you know. I feel like my South Side roots make make me uh, tough enough to power through it. So that that I, I'll be honest with you, it's it's uh, it, it's been a hard road, but it's good. It's very rewarding uh, to see this, you know, everything come to fruition, and for us to have professional tennis tournaments and stuff here. But you know, the the road was hard. I mean, I I tell you, you know, just I'm glad to see HBCUs getting the notoriety that they're getting now, right. because I would say, if I'm being honest, uh, a lot of when I was trying to raise money, right, right, amongst corporations and amongst the wealthy crowd who might have went to Ivy League schools or some of these, you know, larger institutions, uh, I felt like on a consistent basis that my HBCU degree was a hindrance mm-hmm. for what I was trying to do. Right. It was like, 
uh, you didn't go to Kellogg or Booth. Right. So your family MBA is not really an MBA. You know, mm-hmm. I, I had that feeling, right? And it wasn't just my insecurity. Mm-hmm. It was a real feeling. You know right. what I mean? I think now, you know, supporting HBCUs, believing in their potential is, is, a, is a fad. But, you know, four years ago, it wasn't a fad. Right. Four years ago, it was I was sitting in the room with, with four or five people that went to Harvard, Yale, Dartmouth, Booth, mm-hmm. you know, and so, mm-hmm. you know, it was, it was, uh, it, it, it made my life harder, right? right. Um, just in terms of proving I had the capacity and the intellect to sort of make this happen. Well, you know, Kamal, I think from a standpoint, and you're absolutely correct, like I always tell people that if Vice President uh, Kamala Harris didn't tell anybody she went to Howard, they would assume she went to an Ivy League school. Because people just don't assume that type of academic training can lead to somebody being the vice president of the United States. But you also were playing in the lane where, you know, there was a rarity, you know, from the standpoint of tennis. You know, mm-hmm. you, you can't you don't associate tennis with a with a historically black college and university. You just don't do that. And so but you do you do. From an academic standpoint, when you realize that 80 percent of the black doctors and dentists are, who are black come from HBCUs, 40 percent of the members of Congress who are black come from HBCUs, 24 percent of the STEM graduates who are black come from HBCUs. You know, North Carolina a t graduates more black engineers, either white or black colleges. You know, that type of information is what I'm about. That's, what, that's why I got you on the show, because important people see there are so many different styles because of the fact that, you know, it is limited amount of information when I see that Mackenzie Scott gives out $4.1 billion, but they don't tell you why she gave out the $4.1 billion. And so when I bring you on the show to talk about you, I move the conversation of FAMU to the forefront because here's a man making a difference who should be recognized for his academic training, but also for his black excellence. And that's really one of the reasons I brought you on the show because now, because I want to talk about this tennis tournament that you're kicking off because it's the first ever and you're producing it. Yeah. Well, let me say this. When you think about uh, black college tennis. I went to FAMU mm-hmm. and I'm the third black person to coach a Grand Slam champ. Right. Sloan Stevens, I, right? Sloan Stevens. Walter Johnson was the first. He coached out the and Arthur. Mm-hmm. Richard Williams was the second. He coached Venus and Serena. Mm-hmm. And I'm the third. Mm-hmm. And I coached Sloan Stevens. OK, so that's FAMU number one right there. Uh, Zach Evident. Mm-hmm. was the only black coach on the men's pro tour. He was coaching Francis TFO. He also went to FAMU. Okay, wow. Okay, cool. Althea Gibson mm-hmm. went to FAMU. Mm-hmm. And so the blacks that are in tennis <laughs> also have a great history and a, and a relationship with FAMU, you know, with, with HBCUs. You Thank know what you. I mean? So I think that's also, you know, little known fact, but I think it, it's important to know that, you know, two years ago, the only two black coaches and all the pro tennis both went to HBCU. Right. Uh, and so, you know, even my teammate, my teammate, Noah Wadawu, coach Melanie Udan, who, mm-hmm. you know, if you Google her story years ago, she made this incredible run at the U.S. Open. So mm-hmm. I think that, um, you know, we, we've got to sort of um, promote it and talk about it more. But fam, you... Uh, and she was out of I mean, Atlanta, right? Wasn't Melanie out of Atlanta? Yeah, she was out of Atlanta. Absolutely. Exactly. I definitely but know. H- H- HBCU graduates and tennis players have had a, a, a big imprint on professional tennis for a long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it just so happened that we're, we're very modest personalities. You know, Noel is very modest. I'm very well, leave that to me. Le- leave that shout out to me. That's my yeah. job. My job is to p- get you to talk about it, to be able to give you a platform to be able to shout it out. And then we should accept the responsibility that this is legitimate and we should support it. Because people, yeah. you know, you could say it was tough, but, you know, man, you know, six, six, $16.9 million black owned and operated tennis facility. Facility. You did a really good talker of people believe in what you have to say and what you've accomplished. So I always say that sometimes we work so hard, Kamal, that we kind of forget that people believe in us. And we don't sit back and look at all our success. And sometimes the grind can overwhelm you. And I'm not saying it's overwhelming you. Brother, look, you've coached mm-hmm. a Grand Slam tennis champion. And we all saw this weekend how tough that is. You know, Emma, who won this weekend at 18 years old, the previous Grand Slam, she had to walk away because the pressure was too great. 
at the Wimbledon. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. you see how it affected uh, Novak Djokovic, you know, and afterwards he he said he was relieved. You know, every every game he played, Rob Laver was in the stands. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, right. well, what's up? Are you, you going to take it or you're not going to take it? You know what I'm saying? Then the skinny <laughs> Russian come along and he can't even, every one of his serves was during their ace. And so, right. but, the, but that's that pressure. You know, you putting on a tennis tournament, that's another level of pressure and expectation. Talk about that. Yeah, so, um, I mean, you know, with COVID, um, there was an opportunity to add some tournaments to the calendar mm-hmm. uh, with the with the pros not going to Asia this year because of the pandemic. Uh, and so, you know, it was a good, you know, I made sure that, you know, just as I did in my corporate career uh, prior to 2017 or prior to 2015 when I left corporate America, you know, I made sure that when I'm at these events and at these tournaments that I network, continue to meet people, be a good person. Um you know, really uh, exemplify what it means to be a black man who HBCU grad, who's right. educated, comes from a good family, mm-hmm. uh, and not just be seen as just a tennis coach. And so over that time, I've had to, you know, I've built some relationships, um, you know, in the C-suite, you know, with the tennis C-suite per mm-hmm. se. Uh, and then, you know, I've been working to just sort of bring things like that to Chicago because with excess tennis, it's a cradle to grave approach. You know, the cradle is obviously teaching the kids and then the grave is being able to support professional tennis and, and, and like bring it to the inner city, you know, like, you know, the kids in this neighborhood don't have the opportunity to go to New York and watch us open. So right. my goal is to bring us open to them. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, that was always a part of the strategy, uh, and the vision. And this year we happen to, you know, be able to maneuver and negotiate to be able to pull it off. So it, it was great. I mean, and, and it, it really is. I mean, listen, what, what black promotion or black ownership in a tennis event means mm-hmm. is that you can have black suppliers. Right. When I go to tennis tournaments, there are no black suppliers. Right. The security firm that got the contract is white. The catering company got the contract is white. The transportation company got the contract is white. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I go to U.S. Open, I walk 15 feet and my credential gets checked every five feet. Right. You know, this, this is 2018, the year after Sloan won. I'm like, hey, guys, my face is on that billboard right there. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I am I, I'm that guy. So let me buy. Right. And so I think that just comes from not having enough. Uh, enough black enough black bodies on the site, and right. so you know, being able to own this event really gives me the opportunity to a give out wild cars to up and coming black players, mm-hmm. and b uh, support black vendors. You know, mm-hmm. so we have black caterer, black security company, black graphic design, black printer, black PR, black marketing. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of the ball kids were African Americans, uh, and so um, you know, it, it just really, really gives an opportunity to sort of continue what, what the world is trying to do now, right? Which is support black people and expose uh, the world to black people. Because, you know, I would say about tennis, it's the ultimate melting pot. I mean, it is the globalist of games. And, um, you know, it, we've got to start to welcome everybody into the game, right? The Serbians, right. the Czech, the Russians, uh, the the South Americans, the Canadians. I mean, all of us. We got a girl from Tunisia that's coming to town. So, you know, the, the, like the, the world needs early exposure to each other. Right. And this event allows that to right. happen. Well, you see that. You just see all the uh, mixed race winners and champions that are in tennis nowadays from Canada, mm-hmm. from Japan. and But again, with that whole thing, you know, I, I talked to a very humble man. Kamal Murray is a humble guy. You know, Excess Tennis Village is on 13 acres, y'all. OK, I live on five acres. I know what 13 acres looks like. OK, 15 <laughs> outdoor courts, 12 indoor courts. OK, it's a fitness center classroom It's located primarily in a low income area of Chicago. So when I talk to him, I look at him, I look at square in the eye and go, brother, you're special. You're doing something I know. Some people would consider impossible. God gave you a talent, put you in the right direction. And say, hey, man, your, your, your brother just say, pick up that racquetball. Your mom says she's going to keep you busy with babysitting duties. And then whether you say you didn't love it or not, there is a love for it. And then yeah. you're making a difference because Sloan Stevens won't be Sloan Stevens without you. She's not a Grand right. Slam champion without you. And in, in the fact that you are affecting 3,000 students annually at your facility in Chicago makes a difference. The fact that you're sending young students to colleges on scholarship opportunities is, is impressive. And when you say all those things, and I'm not just trying to make you down in the dumps and say, hey, man, you need to thump your chest. I'm just saying, brother, you're special. And that's my job is to acknowledge that and to get you to understand that you're a valued member of this world. Thank you, brother. I appreciate you. I appreciate you having me on. I mean, you know, look, 
I've got tons of people in my life that provide me encouragement. And when I start slowing down, yes. they kick me right in the butt and say, keep on going, boy. You know, Zeke Garrison's one of those people. Billy Jean's one of those people. Uh, a brother named Les Coney, you know, because it, it gets hard. So I appreciate what you just said. Uh, I appreciate the encouragement. Um, and uh, hey, kudos to you too, man. Thank you for, for having me on and, and supporting what I'm trying to do. Yeah, I'm going to talk to my boy Stephen A. Smith. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get, we're, I'm going to connect you with him, man. After this interview, I got to do some extra for you too, man, because you're special. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, and Stephen A. would appreciate it. You know, I think, you know, one of the things about this facility, it was it was created with a lot of help from NBA players. So mm-hmm. uh, my best friend in high school and still to this day is a guy named Quentin Richardson. Uh, I know Quentin. Yeah, Q. Uh, Phoenix yeah, Suns. Phoenix Suns. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Phoenix Suns. Yep. Yeah, uh, from Chicago. And then mm-hmm. Wayne Wade and Bobby Simmons. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a lot of people sort of, uh, you know, help this facility come here, whether it's like, hey, give me some game tickets so I can entertain this person. Uh-huh. Or, hey, I need a check. Right. I know you got it. I, I, you got the Mercedes. I need a check. So, right, right. Um, you know, there's a lot of basketball influence uh, in, this, in this facility as well, because in Chicago, in addition to the business community, there's a lot of athletes, right. you know, that way make it, make it from the South and West Side. Now, who are some of those South athletes, side? NBA athletes that you just mentioned? I kind of didn't hear them all. Oh, yeah. Quentin Richardson, Dwayne Way, Bobby, um, you know, they all kind of stepped up road checks to support uh-huh. the calls. Still involved, still supportive, uh, working on phase two and three with those guys. So, uh, um, you know, a Keon Dooling's daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, trains here. You know, he's the coach of the Utah Jazz. His Absolutely. Daughter actually lived, mm-hmm. lived with me this summer. Um, he was Q's teammate back in the day. So, you know, a lot of a lot of help from a lot of different sources. Well, my man, you keep winning. And again, uh, I'm going to help promote this and uh, keep you in the forefront of uh, black excellence, my brother. And uh, again, you're making a difference. And uh, I, I can't, uh, if you ever need a kick in the butt, just just uh, ask Bobby. Bob, I know Bobby. I, 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 when you said Bobby, I, he used to lay on, he's in LA, when I was in LA, we used to stay on the same floor, same condo. So uh, okay. you, I know him very well, man. And uh, I know his brother, and I know exactly that Chicago world that he, uh, we talked about, uh, but last year we talked about uh, on the phone doing an interview. And uh, so I really appreciate you, man, coming on Monday, making conversation, just to tell your story. And kick you in the butt, okay? Right, right. <laughs> I appreciate you having me, brother. Oh, thank you. If you want to hear any of my interviews on Money Making Conversation or he or see my interviews on Money Making Conversation, please go to moneymakingconversation.com. I am Rashawn McDonald. I am your host. <laughs>